If you are here with us for the first time, we do want you to know that th this series of messages is, um, is, a, is a sort of training summer, and we want this series of messages to come as a blessing to you, to know that in our faith, there is a way of loving people that is gentle and compassionate and carries a, a, a deep desire to bless the folks with whom our lives intersect. And you may be among them, so receive this knowledge as a gift and as an encouragement. The, the series title is called BLESS. BLESS is an acronym. It stands for Begin With Prayer, Listen, Eat, Serve, and Share. And each week we're taking up one piece of that. What we're talking about this summer is what it means to live like a follower of Jesus. So I don't want you to see those um, five parts, bless, listen, eat, serve, and share, as if they are a system that you're supposed to follow. Think of them more like means of grace. These are evangelistic means of grace. And you put them together like a puzzle and you use the parts that work for you in any particular relationship or season of your life. So we learned last week, this is a way of thinking about the Christ-following life that helps me live out what Christ followers believe about every person's need to know Jesus. Because, as we've said so often, everyone deserves a fair account of the gospel and a personal encounter with the living God. Amen? Everyone. So praying for people, listening to their stories, taking time to sit with them, all of that connects me to what God is doing in the lives of those in my normal circles of engagement, which means we're not trying to get you to go knocking on doors or to wear a sandwich sign that says, turn or burn. <laughs> this is something more personal. As we said, it's a way of life that loves those in my circle of engagement and trusts God with the outcome. So, so loving and listening are closely related. I'm wondering, they don't have listening as one of the, um, as one of the love languages in those things that list the love languages, but I'm just going to tell you right now, listening is my love language. Not, not me listening, you listening is my love language. Is there anybody else here who feels it when somebody has heard you? Like you just feel it. You feel loved when someone has heard you. Loving and listening are closely related. So some of this is a very elementary lesson, a reminder to focus on the folks around us so we can listen and love them while we trust God to move. And what we're talking about rejects both passivity and manipulation and evangelism. Loving and listening is not the same as osmosis evangelism, as Christopher called it last week. This is an intentional decision to care for another human being and for their story in the way we would like to be cared for. This way of caring helps us live into God's vision of being a missional community that helps people become whole through Jesus. And that's the point of this summer series called Bless. It is to live into God's vision of being a missional person who follows Jesus generously and simply and lovingly out into the world. And today, we're going to talk about one piece of that process, and it comes with a question. So if you're taking notes, I want you to write this at the top of your page. Who are you willing to ask Jesus for? Who are you willing to ask Jesus for? The best way to engage the message is with your Bible, something to write with and something to write on. Turn with me, if you've got your Bible, to Acts chapter 8. That's where we'll be. We're looking at a scene that begins in verse 26. And as usual, there is a backstory to this scene. So before we get to, to, the, to the passage we're going to look at, to the scene, I want to tell you the backstory. When Acts chapter 8 opens, a guy named Stephen has just been stoned to death the first martyr among the disciples. That's a big deal. After Stephen is killed, persecution against Christians goes wild, and that sends the apostles out of Jerusalem and into the surrounding region. And one of those disciples, a man named Philip, ends up in a town called Samaria preaching the gospel. And Acts chapter 8 tells, him, tells us he's doing great work. People get delivered of impure spirits. People who are paralyzed get healed. A lot of people come to know Jesus. It's a lot. So Peter and John come to help, and they pray for all these new believers to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There was, this was like real revival happening in, in Samaria. And, and that 
counterintuitively, I guess, is what Philip is called out of. You would think God would want him right where he's been bearing fruit, but God calls him out of this. The angel of the Lord sends him down a road out of town where he finds a man sitting in a chariot. And that's where our passage begins, Acts chapter 8, verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south on the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandike, which means the queen of Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit of Philip, he was reading actually the same thing we just read when we were in our prayer time. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. I want you to underline all of verse 29. The spirit told Philip, go to that, go to that place and just stand next to it. The, the first thing that strikes me is that Philip hears from an angel of the Lord or the Holy Spirit or both. It's referenced both ways, but that's not the point. The point is Philip hears because he is listening. So the first thing we learn is that good prayer begins with listening. I bet that a lot of us were not taught that, that listening is also prayer. But listening, speaking, either way, when we're talking to God or listening to God, it's prayer. And the listening side is something that Christopher is really good at. And he's taught me this. He will often start a prayer by saying, let's just listen before we start to pray. I got to tell you, when he first came and he would first do that, I would laugh. I don't know why. I couldn't keep it together when he'd say that. Maybe it just felt awkward. But now I get it. it, it we'll sit and we'll listen for a minute before anyone speaks. I think that's wisdom. When we practice the listening side of prayer, we're actually practicing trust that if we listen, God will speak. Let me say that again. We're practicing trust that if we listen, God will speak. And it's true. I've noticed that God does tend to speak when we're listening. I've also noticed that it usually takes me a while to get quiet enough to hear him. I've noticed I'm less likely to hear God if I have my phone in my hand. I'm also less likely to hear from God if I don't give the process time to work. It usually takes me about 20 minutes to get my mind still enough to really listen. And I'm saying this just in case the listening side is hard for you too. I have learned that the listening side of prayer is not something I can rush. I've also noticed that over time, I've begun to understand how God speaks what his voice sounds like in my experience of it, and how he is likely to move. Ray Steadman says this, Prayer is not a way by which we get God to do what we want. Prayer is a way in which we get involved in what God wants. That's really what we're talking about when we talk about listening prayer. And it's what we're talking about when we talk about the kind of praying that blesses people. If we want to get better at loving our neighbors well, it starts with learning to see what God sees in another person so we can get involved in what God wants to do. Let me give you an example. M Margaret Thurkelson is probably the greatest woman of prayer I've ever known, an amazing woman of prayer. She had a prayer group that went on for like decades, and they would they would, you know, people would come to, into their mind when they were praying, and they would just intercede and intercede and intercede for people. And there was this one guy that they really felt the burden to intercede for. He was kind of a mess of a human being, kind of in and out of church. They just grabbed hold with both hands and prayed for this person. And they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed for him. And they were crying out to God for, you know, telling God all the things God needed to do for this guy. And then one day the guy was in church and Margaret was sitting a, a few seats behind him. And she was just interceding and interceding and telling God all the things she wanted God to do for this man. And then, then she just took a breath, something, took a minute gave God uh, just a little bit of room to speak, and she heard him say, unmistakably, Margaret, shut up. <laughs> she said, 
She heard him say, I am trying to do things in this man's life, and you're getting in the way of it. Stop. You know, there are times when we are praying to keep somebody from hitting the bottom of the pit while God is trying to desperately get them to bounce off the bottom so they can see what's necessary to come up. Amen? You don't know what God is doing in a life, and that's why the listening is so important. So let me get really practical about it. How do you practice listening? Probably it works best, if you've never done this before, if you, if you set a timer. Maybe five minutes. If you can't sit still for five minutes, try two or one. Whatever you can commit to. Then write down everything you hear. While you're sitting there listening, just write it down. Don't judge it. Just write it. And over time, this has been my experience. As God finds you faithful to seek out that place of listening prayer, he will be faithful to show up to. You will begin to hear things that sound smarter than what you could have thought of yourself. You'll begin to develop hungers for specific areas or people where God is working, maybe in a life or a situation, maybe even in an area of the world, and you'll get confidence to do things that sound counterintuitive, confidence to tell people what you hear because you'll have more confidence in what God sounds like when he speaks. You'll know his voice when he tells you something, and you'll be excited about responding and watching God work. I want you to look at verse 29 again, Acts 8, 29. The Spirit told Philip, go to the chariot and stay near it. It's probably the best verse in the whole story. I'm convinced this is the key to prayers that, that care for soul. souls. When, when, when God tells Philip to get up close to that chariot and stand there, stay near it. Basically, that's God teaching Philip how to get close enough to someone so he can listen with one ear toward that guy and the other ear toward heaven. All Philip had to do, the only instruction he got, was just to stand there and wait. He didn't have to have answers or a plan or really to know anything. So this standing up close, this is a prophetic act. It depends on the Holy Spirit's leading and also on your obedience. But that's it. So last week, we were given a bookmark. If you don't have a bookmark right now, if you just raise your hand, someone will bring you one. Just keep your hands raised. Oh, we got quite a few. So we're going to take a minute. We're going to take a minute. There you go. We might actually, Christopher, use a little, she could use a little help, I bet. Yeah. Just keep your hand raised while she's, because we have a lot of folks. There you go. We got some here in the middle, some over here. All right. Anybody else need one? Anybody else? Work? Right here, Christopher. Right up here. Oops. Yeah. Christopher. Christopher, right there. There you go. Anybody else? All right. Perfect. So on one side are all the things we can do to bless another human being. Remember, think of these like means of grace. Not a, not a, not a system, but a means of grace. On the other side is a place where we can make two lists, one for the people in our life group, people we are already, you know, working out our salvation with, and the other one is for our neighbors, whoever it is we've decided we're going to get a heart for. I got to tell you, when I asked God to help me with my list, that second one, I immediately thought of a group of people I'm in close proximity, physical proximity with that I have never intentionally prayed for by name. It just came to me immediately, and I can't believe I've never thought to pray for these people by name. So I listed them on my card, and I have started to pray for them. I have to tell you, actually, um, I, I've now prayed for them enough that I don't need the card anymore to remember their names, and there's 13 of them. 
These are not people I ever prayed for regularly. Some of them, I didn't even know their names. So I had to figure that out so I could pray for them. I went and found their names. But now I'm praying for them every day. And as I'm praying, I am feeling verse 29. It's like the Spirit has said to me, just go stand next to that person in prayer. It's all I need you to do. Get up close to them by praying for them. Let me, let me say that again. We can get close to a person just by praying for them. And this is what I've discovered so far. I've discovered that just by praying for these people by name, people I know virtually nothing about, I am beginning to get God's heart for them. I'm beginning to get curious about what their lives are like, what their stories are. It's not something I'm forcing. It's very organic. It's not a gimmick or a parlor trick. All I am doing is what God told Philip to do for this total stranger he found on the road. The Spirit told Philip, just go over there. Stand near him. Don't bring any big agenda with you. Just get up close so you can get curious about what I am doing in this life. In fact, in fact, you may actually do more damage than good if you get over there with an agenda or a plan. You kind of need to just be with an open heart. Just pray. So I want you to tell your neighbor right now, you don't have to have a plan. Go ahead, tell them, you don't have to have a plan. Isn't that the best? It's... It's one place in your life you actually don't have to have a plan. Where having a plan can actually work against you. All you're doing is being obedient. And somebody has said this, only when obedience doesn't make sense do we begin to learn to obey. So Philip found himself on the side of a road just as this Ethiopian man passed by. And so he went over and he stood by the guy's chariot with one eye, excuse me, one ear toward the man, one ear toward God. And then verse 30, Philip ran up to the chariot, heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. And just listening, Philip was like, well, I got a question I can ask. Do you understand what you're reading? How can I, the guy said, unless somebody explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of Scripture the eunuch was reading. It's the same, exact same passage of Scripture we read this morning. He was led like a, sh a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak to his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or somebody else? And then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. The man was a high-ranking official in the Ethiopian government. He was in charge of the whole treasury. And he was a eunuch, which means he had been altered physically, surely not his choice, so he could give himself completely to whatever work he'd been set apart for. That was a terrible thing to do to a person. And to add insult to injury, eunuchs were not allowed into, into the Jewish world, but evidently this guy was loved by God because this is who Philip was sent to. And even though he'd never be allowed into the temple as a eunuch, this man got interested in the Jewish faith. He'd been to Jerusalem. He was on his way home when Philip found him. So there's Philip standing outside this man's chariot, listening, waiting. He hears the guy reading from Isaiah, and he asks, do you know what you're reading? And the man says, I, I can't understand this because I'm not allowed in the temple to be taught. So how can I understand unless somebody teaches me? Do you realize there are people all over the world right now with some version of that question on their minds? Wondering how their lives connect with the good news about Jesus. Wondering, because nobody has explained it to them, that it was all for them. <laughs> and maybe they're asking with some frustration because they can't figure out how to get in here from where they are. So they're asking in a thousand different ways, in a thousand different languages, how can I know unless somebody comes after me? I have a friend named Joy. She is 
amazing. I have two friends named Joy. This is a different friend named Joy. <laughs> this Joy has served on the mission field in Russia, and she and her husband have trained literally tens of thousands of Christian leaders around the world. She's probably been to every country. She has more energy than five of me. She's amazing. And she's a walking miracle. When she was a young woman, she played softball. Um, she was semi-pro, actually, right after college. And her team went all the way to whatever the finals were in that sport. The last game, last pitch, last hit was the one that would win or lose the game. And the ball came at joy. And she dove for it. I mean, she must have really dove for it. Went, flew through the air. And when she fell, she caught the ball. But when she hit the ground, she knocked her spine completely out of whack and ended up paralyzed, completely paralyzed from the neck down. So for 18 months, she was left laying on the floor of her house on a pallet in excruciating pain, completely unable to move. They could not figure out any other option for her. While she was laying there, she had an experience of the Holy Spirit that was really pretty powerful. But she also noticed this, that a lot of Christians cared about her and even cared for her, but almost none of them prayed for her. It's like they didn't know how, didn't really believe their prayers might help her get better. So people would look at her and they'd offer sympathy, but nobody seemed to know how to pray for her. One day an evangelist came to town as, as a guy named Tom Barrett from South Georgia. Remember that Joy couldn't walk, but some family member took her and got her kind of out uh, on the outside of whatever place where Tom Barrett was preaching and just laid her on the sidewalk there. And so there she was laying on the sidewalk. Somebody got Tom to come out there and, and see her laying there paralyzed. And Tom looked down at her and said, I'm guessing you're not lying there for fun, are you? And then she, he asked her her story, and she told him her story. And, and, uh, and then he asked her, have you ever asked God to heal you? And she said inside herself, she was like, are you crazy? Are you kidding me? But before she could even answer him, he, uh, he said, honey, and this is kind of her words of his words, honey, I don't claim to understand healing. I don't know why some are healed and some are not, why we sometimes go to church and pray for someone to be healed and then they die the same week. But I do know that everywhere in the Gospels where it says they brought people to Jesus, he healed them. So I just want you to know I'm willing to ask Jesus for you to be healed. I think that is a brilliant way to say that. I'm willing to ask Jesus for you. And I'm telling you all of Joy's story just for that line. So I can ask you, who are you willing to ask Jesus for? Because maybe there is someone in your world who cannot get there by themselves. Who has a wound in their life that keeps them from walking in here without pulling a whole lot of baggage behind them. Who... who who may, for some reason, not be able to hear the language of the church in this moment. But they're waiting to be prayed for. And they might be someone that Jesus is willing to listen for when you pray. The Ethiopian was reading from the book of Isaiah. When his chariot passed Philip on the road, it was a prophetic word about the sacrifice of the Messiah. And so he asked Philip, who is the prophet talking about, himself or somebody else? And I love this part of the story because this is where Philip, because he's been invited now to share from his own experience of having walked with the Messiah, he's, he's invited to help that man see the story of Jesus as his story. So Philip told him about Jesus, of how he was born in a stable to parents of very modest means, of Jesus' love for the scripture and how he taught in the temple, of how the disciples came to follow Jesus and how Jesus sent disciples out to share the message of God's kingdom, of how God wants people to repent of their sins and learn to love each other selflessly. And then Philip told him about the cross about how the religious leaders called for his execution and, and carried it out 
One dark Friday, Jesus was that sheep that was led to the slaughter that the prophet Isaiah pointed to. And maybe Philip even told about how confusing it was for the disciples in those days after the crucifixion, how, how the life seemed to be sucked out of them. But, but when they saw Jesus again, the man who was crucified, dead, and buried was alive again. When they saw that miracle, they knew it was true. He really was sent from God himself to rescue humanity from guilt and to, to restore the world to, to wholeness. In a corrupt and unjust world where this man had his life taken from him for the sake of someone else's selfishness, this had to be good news. And that news was enough of a revelation to give this guy from Ethiopia faith, faith enough to believe that that truth was his truth. That story was his story. So he asked Philip to baptize him right then and there in some little spring or pond. Philip and the man got out of the chariot and walked over to the, to the water and, and waded in. And as the story is told, that man went back to Ethiopia and told so many people about Jesus, just like that Samaritan woman had done. And the news trickled out into the streets, and it found its way into many homes. And before long, the gospel was spreading across all of Africa. And did you know that today, Africa is experiencing a greater harvest of believers than any other region of the world? And God knew both ends of these stories. And he has the joy of watching as his will is accomplished in the world. And that, friends, is the way it is done in the kingdom of God. Amen. Obedience doesn't make sense, but it works. If you want to win a whole city or maybe even a whole continent or, or, or just, just or, or find a whole group of people, find one person, anyone God puts in your mind. Find one person and pray for them. Who are you willing to ask Jesus for? Just get close to them in prayer and begin to listen. Listen to God and to them. Let them tell you where they are. Maybe share a meal or coffee. Ask good questions. Listen for how you might love them well. And then one day... You'll find the open door. Jesus will show you the door to tell your story of what Jesus has done for you. Larry Crabb brings this concept down to the soul level, asking, what would it be like if we had a vision for each other, if we could see the lost glory in ourselves, our family, our friends? That power is the life of Christ carried into another soul across the bridge of our vision for them. I would say even across the bridge of our prayer for them. A life that touches the life in another with nourishing power, vision, or prayer for others both bridges the distance between two souls and triggers the release of the power within us. And how do you get a vision for another person? Just pray for them. Begin with prayer. Begin is not a throwaway word or, or a B word that's just there to fit the acronym. It's actually there to make an important point. The hardest part is getting started. But just get started. Begin. Try something. And if it doesn't work, nobody dies. Just pick a few people and write their names down and then get up close to them in prayer. I'm willing to ask Jesus for you. Do you know what happened to my friend Joy when someone made that commitment to her, that evangelist? He did ask Jesus for her. And that night, that young woman got completely, immediately healed. Immediately. She jumped up off the floor he, he told her, he said, after he prayed for her, he said, I want you to try to stand up. She jumped up off the floor. It must have been the power of the Holy Spirit and started doing jumping jacks. A woman who had been paralyzed for 18 months 
The next day she ran. I get it. That does not happen every time. It probably doesn't even happen often. But it does happen. People do get healed, saved, and delivered because other people pray. So who are you, at, who are you willing to ask Jesus for? I want to invite you to take your little card. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. And by pray, I mean listen. We're just going to take a minute. And we're going to listen. Don't listen with any agenda in your mind. Just listen. And if God lays somebody on your, on your heart, if he puts them in your mind you think of somebody's name or you think of their face, you don't know their name, but you've got their face in your mind and you've always been a little curious about that person or concerned, write it down on that, on that list. You can just write, person at Kroger I see every week. If you don't know a name, you'll, you don't have to have a plan. Just listen. And if you've got a name or a face or an idea, would you just pray for them right now? Maybe that prayer begins with something as simple as, God, I just want to ask you for this person. That's it. I just want to ask you for them. I just want to ask you to work in their lives, to do something in them that maybe you needed a prayer in order to do. I want to ask you to give me a divine curiosity about them, Jesus. I want to ask you to make me obedient, to bless them through my prayers. I don't have a plan here, Jesus, but I'm trusting that you can speak to me for the sake of another human life, and I am trusting that the gospel is worth my prayers. Lord, I pray over my friends here in this room. I pray for the one who might actually be on the receiving end of someone else's prayer or maybe has been, that they would experience themselves as blessed this morning. I pray for the ones who are trying to figure out how to take their spiritual lives to the next level. Lord God, I ask that you would bless them as they bless others. And I pray for our community, Jesus, that we might become a community of blessing, loving, Carrying, supporting, compassionately, generously, caring for souls. We love you, Jesus, and honor and worship you. Amen.